Good afternoon again. Uh, just want to introduce our next speaker. He's going to be talking to us about something that's become all too familiar for us in the fire service and uh, talk about the 25 when it comes to cancer prevention. We have Jim Berkema, Bernica, sorry, out of Dayton, Ohio, and uh, has been doing a lot of this stuff at his home department. He's going to share some words with us today. Welcome. Thank you very much. All right, everybody hear me okay? Good deal. Well, it was working just a second ago. Huh. All right, good times. All right, so I am a Dayton, Ohio firefighter paramedic. I've been there almost 21 years. I've got, uh, I've got two more shifts left there, and I will be transitioning to a 40-hour wellness position. I don't even know if that's the actual title of it yet. I don't even know my hours, but Monday the 25th, I'm off the streets. I'm going 40 hours. I'm doing cancer stuff, behavioral health stuff, just everything regarding our wellness. Been doing this cancer stuff for over 15 years now. I started with the Firefighter Cancer Support Network. I was the Ohio chapter guy. Then I started, uh, became the VP of the regions where I added a bunch of different states and trained them all. And then when the original founder and president stepped down, I ended up getting voted in to take his place. So I was doing stuff on really a national level pretty early on. In the last seven years, I've just been working um, just uh, have my own business now, Firefighter Cancer Consultants, where I go department to department and compare current practices to the best practices out there. I've got a few different podcasts out there, and I'm also the health and safety guy for our union. So I've been doing this firefighter cancer stuff for obviously quite a while, really ahead of a lot of the people out there, but this all, I gotta tell you, this all changed the spring when I actually got diagnosed. So there's me at the Ohio State James Cancer Center. I think this is right after they took out part of my thyroid for thyroid cancer. So I could do a whole class just on everything I went through, but I've got an hour. So what I want to do is really just concentrate on what we can do to reduce our risk. Or if we do get cancer, what can we do to catch it early? So I'm really just going to go over that handout that Kim was kind enough to give you. We're just going to go over all that, okay? So before we even go into this, everybody has a risk management policy. I, it doesn't matter which department you're at. They all basically say the same thing, right? We're going to risk a lot to save a lot. We're going to risk a little to save a little. So keep that in the back of your mind when we're doing all this cancer stuff. You know, is it really worth the risk? Come on. So I'm like trapped up here with a little controller, I'm sorry. So let's talk about right away our SCBA use. So on car fires, I know some of us are guilty of doing stuff like this before. There are all, all sorts of carcinogens in that car fire. They're actually different depending on the stage of that car fire. Point of the story, wear your gear and wear your mask every single time. And it's the same exact thing when it comes to dumpster fire, trash fire. So I don't have no idea what's inside that, but it's probably not good. So make sure you're wearing your gear, make sure you're wearing your mask. You can also fight these defensively. You can just make that dumpster into a pool. You don't even have to get close to it. That's an option for you. As far as structure fires, the transitional attack, you know, the slicers, the hitting it hard from the yard, I'm okay with this because my philosophy on all this stuff is anything we can do to reduce our exposures. So if we're able to get a good knockdown from the outside and then go inside and finish it off, we're not going to get exposed to as much stuff as we just went right inside and went to the fire. 
You have to remember the modern fire atmosphere. It's a hazmat scene, and every single fire we go on, they're all different, all of them. So this is a list of some of the carcinogens and then the cancers that they cause that we are exposed to in or around a fire. Now, if you're still going around and you've got your CO and you've got your HCN monitor, you know, you're starting to overhaul or getting ready to start, and you go, okay, CO, 35 parts per million, HCN under five, all right, we're all clear, we can take our mask off. We have to realize is that has nothing to do with any of these. There's no relation between CO and HCN and formaldehyde or benzene. So because of that, let me back up. When you're looking at that monitor, you're looking at the IDLH, what's immediately dangerous to our life and health. What I'm worried about is the EDLH, the eventually dangerous to life and health, the stuff that's going to catch up to us later on. Cancer has a latency period of 10, 15, sometimes 25 years before it shows up. So that's why we need to do everything we can early on to hope that we don't catch this stuff later on. So if we're in that environment, that modern fire atmosphere, and I had all these different options in front of you here, it's time to do overhaul. Which one do you think I would like for you to use? I'm hearing whispering. Nobody wants to say it because they're like, oh, I hate to say it. It's heavy. I'm tired already. I already put the fire out. It's the only one on here that's going to block out 100% of our inhalation exposures. Everything else is going to let different particulates or gases in. So I know it's easy for me to preach just being up here. You got to remember this, I still got two more days at least of doing this stuff. The only thing natural in the modern fire anymore is ourselves. Everything else is synthetic, it's petroleum based, it's flame retardants, it's all sorts of bad stuff that we're inhaling and we're also absorbing. So let's talk about the logistical difficulties of wearing an SCBA during overhaul, because I know it's not that easy. It's, I can't just wave a wand and all of a sudden you can use the SBAs and everything is okay. First of all, you're gonna need manpower. You're gonna need more of you for longer. It's gonna take longer to do this overhaul because you're gonna be tired. So you're gonna have to keep more apparatus on that scene to do that, that overhaul. You're gonna go through more cylinders. So whether you have some kind of air cylinder truck that can refill it or just extra bottles, you're gonna end up going through a lot more of these. Make sure you have a rehab. Try to have a medic scene or medic there the entire duration of that scene from start to finish. You know, initially they're there in case there's any victims, but at some point they also need to be there for you. So being able to do a rehab, make sure your vitals are okay, give you an opportunity to rest and rehydrate, you're gonna to need to do that more and more often if you're actually using air. You're gonna to have to have coverage, your station fill-ins. Now whether that's mutual aid or you're large enough to where you have your own, you know, individuals that can come in or you recall, whatever it may be, just because you're at that fire doesn't mean there's gonna be no other emergencies you know, throughout your city. You can do overhaul a little bit differently. One of the easy things to do is set up a fan and let that go. It should be the last thing you, you pick up from the scene. I don't want it to be a, a gas fan because that's just going to throw CO back into that scene, but an electric fan, a battery fan, those work great and they're just going to dissipate that atmosphere that much more. So I've also seen it where they've taken windows and made them into doors just so you can get stuff out that much easier. You can also use your thermal imaging cameras. Really pick out those hot spots, concentrate on there. We don't have to clean every single house cleaner than it was before we got there. The logistics are gonna vary, you're gonna to have to figure them out, but really think about, again, that risk. What are we risking? Why are we risking it? The only life safety that's involved 
in this stage of the fire, it's us. We're the only ones. So let's talk about being on the outside of a fire. Our engineers and command staff, just because you're on the outside doesn't mean there's some magical force field that allows you to be safe. All these chemicals, all these carcinogens are still coming out of that fire scene, and we're still, especially up front, we're usually not wearing anything. So we're absorbing this stuff, we're inhaling this stuff at a mass quantity. At least the people inside, at least they're on air at that initial point. So don't be afraid to put on air. Who cares if you look silly? Think about the big picture again. So whether you're at command, whether you're that first in apparatus operator, you shouldn't have to eat that, that smoke any longer. You gotta be smarter now. So let's talk about our investigators in command. Oftentimes we put the fire out and they say the scene is safe and they go in and they're not wearing anything. Maybe they're wearing a jacket, they're not wearing a mask. Just because that fire is out does not mean the scene is safe. All these chemicals are still gonna be off-gassing. So if they're gonna go in, you gotta wear a mask, gotta wear their gear, just like you expect a firefighter to. You know, and your investigators, a lot of you are investigators. I know it's a big ask to wear all this stuff when you're doing your investigations, but again, what's the risk? What's the reward? The one thing that you can do differently if you're an investigator than I could as a firefighter is there is an option out there. I don't know if anybody have ever heard of this before, but there's industrial SCBAs available on the market. So same cylinder, same mass. The only difference is the harness. They don't have all the bells and whistles. They don't have the pass device. But because they don't have all that stuff, it's about half the weight. So you can still be on air, but it's not quite as cumbersome. All right, using wet wipes. How many of you guys have wet wipes in your apparatus? Great. Let's actually watch a quick video. This is done by uh, the University of Miami. So this is um, super invisible powder that's used actually um, for theft detection and cash. But um, one of the things we're trying to simulate is pretending that this is you hear it okay? uh, black soot, just the type of same type of soot that comes off combustible and burning materials you would encounter in a fire uh, incident response. The initiative actually came to us right, uh, from the Palm Beach County Fire Rescue Department. They were very interested in understanding about how what they did for work was impacting their health, specifically how maybe being a firefighter or an EMS uh, responder may increase their risk for cancer. One of the things we were trying to do today is figure out is there a way we can demonstrate how maybe cancerous materials are transferred from a fire incident response uh, back to uh, the fire station and personal vehicle. And so today was really a teaching exercise and a scientific exercise of trying to see how we demonstrate where soot represented by this invisible dye might be transferring from when they go to respond to a fire and come back to the fire station. So the goal today was trying to be able um, to identify can we feasibly show how so it's transferred uh, from a fire incident response uh, back to their truck and back to the fire station. As you start going through the different scenarios of post-decon into the fire engine, back into uh, the bunk, into the restrooms, um, back here to the coffee table, it starts becoming less visible to the naked eye. But that powder um, that is invisible uh, over chronic exposure could be potentially causing um, cellular changes that we just uh, don't know about yet. And hopefully through some of our studies we can start identifying those changes.
really an eye-opening experience for us because I anticipated, you know, some demonstration of how much um, dye would transfer. I, I didn't realize the, the breadth and scope of how much dye would spread um, within the different uh, scenarios that we were shooting in, as well as uh, continue to transfer on after the first uh, fire engine truck. So for me, it was very impressive to see even um, some of the invisible dye transfer onto the bunks where they're sleeping at night. Um, even if it's a smaller quantity, you could imagine that low dose chronic uh, exposure of this dye might be potentially increasing the risk uh, over time. We filmed today in the um, EMS's personal vehicle, you could easily see even fainter wisps of, of plume of, of dye on the ceiling as well as on the seat that were not direct contacts but were physically visible on this, suggesting that the particulate moves around. Um, so you might not visibly see soot, and in this case we got to see a dye, but that could potentially be increasing your cancer risk. The firefighter works as a, as a fulmite and is transferring you know, carcinogen from where their, their place of work back to their personal home. So we had an opportunity to have a child with us today to be able to demonstrate maybe what happens in passing uh, some of that soap using a soccer ball. Um, so we were able to um, have a child play with one of the EMS firefighters with that soccer ball and we were able to see a uh, second degree uh, transfer of uh, this invisible dye, i.e. the soot, transfer from the, from the EMS to the soccer ball and to the child. One of the activities that I hope uh, arises from this video that we're producing is that firefighters are a little bit more cognizant about how hy hygiene is a very important aspect um, and decontamination is an important aspect of post-incident fire response because it makes them a little bit more aware of not only of the, the soot that they bring back into the fire station but also what they might be taking to their personal homes and sharing with their families through secondary and tertiary contact of this soot um, on their on their own person and I hope that the firefighters see that as a more a way of crazy creating an opportunity for awareness and discussion of how we uh, improve um, you know hygiene and decontamination within the fire service had anybody ever seen that video before it's pretty eye-opening though how we take this stuff from the scene to the firehouse, even take it home. So we probably never really thought about it that way. They did a good job of showing it there, though. So wet wipes. According to the Illinois Fire Service Institute, just using a generic baby wipe, just something you get at Target or whatever store, that's going to take off 54% of the contaminants off your skin. So it doesn't replace taking a shower, but it's something in the meantime. And you got to remember, we're absorbing all this stuff into our skin. There's all sorts of different wipes available that are marketed towards us. Are they really any better? I don't know. There's not really any studies out there that say one is better than the other. But with that being said, I counted when we were doing the video. There's 29 of us. The camera person, maybe they want to throw in two. So 30 of us. Come on. See, my timing is all screwed up. There we go. We can all throw in our money. We can make our own fire wipes. Just let me know. Has anybody seen this movie? You know where this is from? Step Brothers. Step Brothers, yes. It's classic, Will Ferrell. It's a good firehouse movie. All right, anyway. Talk about washing our hands. So this is something we don't think about either. You know, this is just a picture, again, Illinois Fire Service Institute. Somebody took off their own gloves and somebody had somebody else take off their gloves and you can see the difference. And we just know when we're in a fire, we're touching everything, so it's filthy. So if you can do something to get rid of your gloves safely, not expose yourself, that's ideal. Because this is, this is how we end up ingesting and uh, these chemicals and carcinogens as we open up that bottle and we just whatever we had on our, on our hands, we're gonna ingest. So one of the things you can do is either two things really, have somebody with clean hands open it up for you, or just even put on EMS gloves like I have in that picture, back when I had a little bit of hair. All right, so let's talk about gross decon, or as NFPA likes to say, preliminary exposure reduction. So going back to that the Illinois Fire Service Institute, if you just use a dry brush, you're gonna get 23% of the contaminants 
off your, off your gear. You use water, it's going to be 42%. Use water with, with a soap and brush, that's going to get off 85% of the contaminants. So it's not, you're not, you know, everything you were exposed to in that fire, you've already been exposed to. But what this is doing is it's stopping that exposure. You know, you're not going to get to expose to as much stuff by touching it or inhaling it because your gear will be off-gassing. So this is where this comes into play. So I'll show you a, a video that I actually just did back in August. I was in Saskatchewan as soon as they let me up there. And uh, there's going to be a, basically all these different steps are going to be done in video format from footage we shot there. But you guys are one of the first people to, to see this. Step six, gross decon, also known as preliminary exposure reduction, or PER for short. This step reduces your inhalation and absorption exposures while on the scene and transporting your PPE back to the fire hall. According to the Illinois Fire Service Institute, using a dry brush will take 23% of the chemicals off the outside of your PPE. Spraying your PPE with water will take 42% of the chemicals off your PPE. Spraying your PPE with water and brushing with dish soap will take off 85% of the chemicals off your gear. We realize it's not ideal to spray your gear down in freezing temperatures. The Saskatchewan WCB and Prince Albert are in the midst of a study that is working on a dry decon alternative that will allow a more thorough decon to be completed in freezing temperatures. Items needed to perform a wet gross decon are affordable and may already be found around your fire hall. These items include a garden hose, nozzle with or without automatic soap dispenser, Dish soap, safety glasses, mask, baby wipes, heavy duty trash bags. It is not recommended to use black trash bags for PER. PPE has been mistaken for trash and thrown away. Here's a demonstration of preliminary exposure reduction. Firefighters should remain on air. Firefighters low on air should be fast tracked. Members can decon each other as they come out. Designated members can also conduct a decon. It's recommended that we wear safety glasses, a mask, and EMS gloves if not wearing our full PPE and BA. PR does not replace washing your PPE. PPE should be washed ASAP upon returning to the fire hall. Conduct your gross decon away from any diesel exhaust. Conducting PER does not render your PPE out of service. Your PPE should be bagged in a way that it can still be accessible if needed. Bagged PPE should be placed in a compartment outside of the cab or in the back of a pickup truck. All right, that was a sexy voice, wasn't it? All right, so we're going to have all these will be different videos. One of the things I didn't talk about is the warm water decon. Obviously, when I looked at the, the temperature when I was coming here, I was like, you got to be shitting me, really? <laughs> 27 degrees? Um, one of the nights or mornings or whatever. This is obviously a problem here. You know, you're, you're not in Florida. So one of the things you can do is you can retrofit your own old apparatus or the, the apparatus you have right now. Uh, there, there's a way that's all about the healthy in and out uh, this came out of Washington, um, and they have a way to basically go in and switch things over pretty cheaply to where you get warm water out of your, your apparatus. It's not hot water, but it's warm water. And you can also get apparatus now that obviously it comes with it, and of course they upcharge you for it, but it's an option. So let's talk about transporting our PPE. So the whole clean cab concept uh, my main thing here is regarding that, if your gear is clean, then it's okay to be in the cab. Uh, if it's dirty, ideally, you have it in a, you throw it in a pickup truck or you have it in another compartment because, again, this stuff is going to off-gas and you're going to breathe this stuff in. When it gets time to take stuff back or just make apparatus in general, if you have an option, don't get cloth seats when you're, when you're, uh, specking a new apparatus. Get vinyl seats just so you can clean this stuff 
really easy. This is kind of an example of somebody cleaning the cloth seat and you could just see how nasty that water was that they pulled out of that seat. So you can also put on something cheap. Just put the, the covers over it just like if you were getting an oil change, getting your car worked on, that's an option too. Again, the clean cab. I'm not saying everything needs to be in it, but if it's dirty, it definitely needs to be outside the cab. That's kind of where my stance is on that. There's all sorts of opinions on that. We get back to the station, we got to get our apparatus in service. We also need to get ourselves in service, but we need to clean our SCBAs, our masks, the hose. When we get back to the station, we got to wash our hands. Now, and I didn't get to talk about this whole thing earlier, but testicular cancer is the number one cancer we get. Our scrotum area is 300% more absorbent. So what I'm asking you is to wash your hands before using the restroom. Get all this stuff off, of, off your hands and then you can use the restroom. And then you probably should still wash your hands afterwards, right? That's how we were raised. So showering. We want to get back to the station. We want to shower as soon as possible. It's important to get this stuff off of our skin. So here is an uncomfortable picture to lead into an uncomfortable segue about an uncomfortably cold shower. So when you take this shower after a fire, I actually want it to be different than the one I hope you took this morning. So ideally, first of all, you're out of service. You know, we, we always get back to the station, we get our equipment in service, we need to get ourselves in service, and that means taking a good quality shower and also changing our uniform, changing our gear. So, but start off uncomfortably cold, and the reason, there's actually a reason for that. I want you to close your pores, I want you to just do a quick rinse off and get whatever was on your skin off your skin, because again, we, we inhale that, or we absorb that stuff into our skin. So just start off cold, quick rinse off, it doesn't have to be long, then you can turn it up and take a regular shower. So along those same lines, I'll talk about saunas real quick. So the idea behind a sauna is whatever stuff we absorb into our skin, we're gonna end up sweating the stuff out. So it sounds really good on paper, right? The, the whole ideal behind it. So the IFF had some questions about it and I think they were fair questions. First of all, they said there's not enough science out there. Second of all, they were fearful that we would absorb the stuff into our skin because again, we're heating our body up. And thirdly, they were, they were, fear, they were fearful that we were gonna be dehydrated and this was gonna make it worse and lead to kidney and heart disorders. So Dr. Burgess from University of Arizona looked into this and this is what he ultimately ended up saying is that he can't tell you that it helps you, but he can't tell you that it hurts you either. So there needs to be a bigger study out there regarding this stuff to, to really determine is this safe or not. So I mentioned before, washer uniforms. Ideally you have a clothes washer and dryer at the station and you can wash your uniforms or clothes in there. You don't have to bring this stuff home and cross-contaminate your family stuff with this, with this dirty uniform or whatever that you were just wore in a fire. Let's talk about washing our PPE. So we gotta make it a point, wash our gear as soon as possible when we get back to the station. NFPA wants you to actually separate your gear. They want you to wash the hoods uh, and the liner from the, or excuse me, the hoods separate from the outer shells and gloves. So the inner part of our gear and our hoods, they don't get exposed to as much stuff. So when we wash it all together, we're cross contaminating it at all. So that's why they want it to wash, be washed separately. Don't forget to also wash your helmet. How many of us have ever washed a helmet or a helmet, Steve? Okay, the outside, the outside. How about, how about the inside, the liner? Good job. Okay, that is, and you're gonna back me up on this, I bet. If you took it out, it was a nightmare to try to put it back in the right way, right? It's not very user friendly. If nothing else, just take some soap and water and a brush and, and just do a good hard job on that and, and you can get a lot of the stuff off that way. 
that is, I mean, it's a reminder of every fire we've been on. And I've had, and I'm not exaggerating when I tell you this, about eight guys on my job in Dayton were right where their helmet sits on their head. They've had skin cancer. So don't forget to wash that. When we get back to the station, we got to switch into a backup set of PPE. In a perfect world, we have a second set fitted specifically for us. A lot of times, it's not a perfect world. So you may have just extra spares laying around, and you try to get something that fits. If nothing else, find somebody who's not working that's close to you in size. I would rather you wear that than put on that gear that's already been contaminated before you wash it. So... They've got new particulate blocking hoods. I say new, but they're really about six or seven years old. Is there anybody that doesn't have these yet? You would know because they're about three times as expensive as the traditional hoods we've been wearing. The traditional hoods that we wore for years do a very poor job of blocking all these particulates into our neck area, which is an area of very high absorption. So these new hoods... Although they're more expensive, they block 99% of those particulates. So let's talk about transporting our gear. So ideally, in a perfect world, this is, this is what I would want you to have. I'd I want you to have a pickup truck, have your gear in the back of the truck in a separate compartment where it's not going to off-gas and nobody's going to breathe it in. If nothing else, an airtight tote works. They also have these fancy filter boxes that are pretty expensive, but you can use those as well. But I really would prefer you not to have your gear just laying there in your back seat or next to you and your SUV in a bag or just there because, again, this stuff will off-gas. There needs to be a separation between the apparatus bay and our living quarters. So just having that... that list I gave you also if you turn it around it actually is a no fire gear sign as well that's something you can put on all the doors and also think about this in EMS rooms too if we go to a lot of times we go in a car accident and we wear our gear try your best to not wear your gear inside that place all right so storing our gear in the stations this is kind of the ideal situation we want it to be dry, we want it to be well ventilated, away from the UV light, hung outside the apparatus bay, where it's, it's not exposed to any diesel exhaust that way. This is the good scenario, but that is usually not how it is. When they made all these fire stations, however many years ago, they weren't thinking about this stuff. They just weren't. So you have to do the best you can. So a lot of times we have our storage in the apparatus bay. So one of the things we can do Let's put gear locker covers on there. That way you're not going to get UV light, and you're also not going to get any diesel exhaust, or at least limit the amount of diesel exhaust that goes on your gear. Not too terribly expensive. It's, it's something that you, you can obtain fairly easy. If nothing else, you can try to be innovative. So this is a department near me. They had all their gear in the bay. They also had a closet that was attached to the bay. And a little bit of work, boom, there's your new gear room. So you might have options like that at your stations. All right, so this will be fun. Let's talk about, this is a nice way of saying, let's talk about PFOS. How many people know what PFOS is? All right, well, let's have some fun on this one. I'm going to start right away with a trailer that kind of explains a little bit about this stuff. Consumer products sold under the Teflon brand are safe. DuPont did, in fact, ask EPA to make those statements, correct? That's correct. When I was pregnant with Bucky, I worked for DuPont around Teflon. They tried to blame me. They said it was something that I did. The more they would tell me that, the more suspicious I got. You did see there was a substantial risk to the women at the DuPont plant. There was no potential risk to the women. There was a potential risk to the fetus. 
It was used in consumer products, manufacturing products, and the applications were endless. These Teflon and Scotchgard chemicals permeated the living world. Today, every baby is born with Teflon chemicals in their blood. DuPont and another company called 3M had been studying this chemical dating back to the 1950s and 1960s. Did you work with a lot of other people that have been sick or died early? Carol Kaplan, Jim Broadwater, Joy Weaver, Steve Bailey, Lona Carr. They are aware of the risk of the product. Risk is relative. If I go out here and sprinkle arsenic around, they'd arrest me for murder. You've lied, and they're still lying. Everybody in this area, in one way or another, is connected to DuPont. You go dealing with somebody's livelihood, you're going to have problems. There was a discussion about, do we need to come up with something in our production that's not going to cause these problems? They conclude, if we launch something new, it's going to cost us a lot of money. We have to stick with the devil we know. Was I a guinea pig? What do you think? You guys are probably wondering why I'm showing you this stuff. Trust me, it's going to be very relative, and I think I'm going to blow some of your minds. So that, is, that whole story is really based off this attorney out of Cincinnati named Rob Balot. He also starred, or, or they had a recent movie uh, made about him called Dark Waters. He also wrote a book called Exposure. So that, that's a documentary. If you're not a documentary guy, but you like movies, Dark Waters. And it's, it's still really the same thing. It's Hollywooded up a little bit, but the content is still there. So I was going to show you the trailer, but I know I'm running out of time. So. Um, these chemicals are basically water resistance, waterproofing. They're in this carpet. They're in our Gore-Tex, in our rain gear. They're in our microwavable popcorns and what they wrap our sandwiches in. They're in Teflon. So, oh, by the way, I should probably say, they're in our fire gear. And they're also in our foam. So, Dr. Graham Peasley from the University of Notre Dame, he did a study regarding our fire gear. This is just a couple years ago. So he looked at 30 sets of fire gear, all different manufacturers. And sure enough, all, this, all these, this fire gear had these chemicals in it. So to kind of paint a picture too, he had two sets of gear born on the same date, same manufacturer. One was used and one wasn't. And one was still in its original bag. And the one in the bag, or excuse me, the gear that was used had 80% of this chemical taken off of it. So the question then is, well, where did it go? Did we inhale it? Did we absorb it? That's what we're trying to figure out. So earlier this year, the IFF try to get rid of these chemicals out of our fire gear. And the reason why they're in this fire gear is because of NFPA. <laughs> this, is, this is, just follow me on here. NFPA has a UV light test for our moisture barrier in which it has PFOS in that test. That's how it can pass that test is by using PFOS. In an ultraviolet light test, in a UV light test, in a part of our gear that doesn't see sunlight. It's the inner part of our gear, but that's what they're testing for. And because this stuff is in there and this test, we still have this stuff in our gear. And this, this, these chemicals, they cause several different cancers, several different illnesses. I mean, it's, it's a thing out there. So uh, NFPA denied that on September 10th. Uh, they did it a, at a, as a Friday Newsday dump where We'll wait till everybody's closed, and then we'll put out the thing. So it is being um, appealed again to the, the actual the board of the NFPA. So we'll see where that goes. And there's different 1970s standards working on this still. There's going to be a point in time when this stuff is gone. But even when it's gone, it's going to be in our gear for 10 years until 
it expires. So along with our gear, it's also again in our foam. Your AFFF Class B foam, if you haven't switched out your phone and got fluorine free foam, the foam you have right now is the bad stuff, is the carcinogens, it's the stuff that's getting into our water systems. So this is big time bad EPA kind of stuff. So there is alternatives out there now, fluorine free foam. You gotta be careful because this gets really convoluted. They'll say, well, no, it doesn't have PFOA, but then it has a different version of these. There's, there's over 10,000 variants of this chemical. And it's, and it's, they're called forever chemicals because they don't go away. They stay in the environment and they stay in our body. So in order to find a foam that we know is safe, there's a, there's a it's called green screen, uh, greenscreenchemicals.org. And you can look on there and there's a list of all the chemicals that they've actually tested to make sure that they don't have these chemicals. So and there's only, I don't even think there's 10 of them out so far. So this is still a pretty new thing. So preventative wise, we have to limit our exposure. These are bioaccumulative uh, chemicals. We have to wear our gear. There's no alternatives. When you're fighting fire, I'm not telling you to not wear your gear. But I am telling you, treat your gear with respect and only use it for fires. You know, don't go to the grocery store anymore. Don't wear it as a winter jacket. Every time you do that, you're gonna absorb these chemicals into your skin. You know, before you get your gear, or when you, as soon as you get your gear, wash it. Get rid of some of these excess chemicals that's on it. Uh, don't do the memorial stair climbs and the working out. Don't do the baby shots. I mean, that's, that's my oldest. I was a dumbass and I did that. You know, don't do the tours with the kids anymore. So this is, I pro again, I probably could have done a whole hour just on this stuff. And it probably deserves an hour because it's, it's scary. Not just, I mean, for us as firefighters, we have those two big additional exposures being our gear and our foam. But this is something, just for a human being, it's a problem. They are looking into right now, they did studies in Australia to where they were able to get a lot of these chemicals out of our, out of our blood by just donating plasma and then just getting rid of that plasma. So we'll see what happens there. So diesel exhaust, I'll touch on that real quick. That is a known carcinogen. There's all sorts of different options out there. There's, there's several different options in that room behind me. You know, the idea is just reduce any exhaust going into your station, reduce any of your exposure. Be mindful where you put your stuff. You know, whenever this medic leaves, yeah, it's hooked up. When it backs up, sprays gear all over, or sprays exhaust over this guy's gear. You know, you really shouldn't have ice machines, pop machines, drinking, drinking fountains. Wait, is it, is it pop or soda here? What? Pop, okay. Cool, we're on the, on the same. All right. Is those, I'm Midwest, it's those East Coast people that say soda. All right. So I had a ice, uh, your ice machine in the bay, grabs a cup of ice, let it melt, and you can see that exhaust gleam in there. So nasty, nasty stuff. Make, make sure you do your apparatus checks, pull the stuff outside, don't leave it up on the hose and, and run it inside. I, I know it gets cold here. I've seen multiple hoses that have been burnt because they get too hot. When you're on scene, don't hang around by the exhaust. Yes, I know it's warm, but you don't want to inhale this stuff. If that means you got to turn the equipment off, turn it off. This is all again, earlier I said, reduce your exposure as much as possible. They've got electric trucks coming out. I'm not, I'll be gone before this stuff happens, but we'll, we'll see, you know, this may be the future. Still staying on that diesel exhaust topic. A lot of times, for whatever reason, we put our EMS equipment in that compartment right over the exhaust. It's what we use more often than anything else. So if you have that, just move it somewhere else. Put something you don't use very often in that compartment. Okay, keep our living quarters doors shut. We wanna have good door seals, you know, have weatherproofing, 
We don't have, want to have our doors kind of half open or even see daylight underneath. And we certainly don't want to prop open our doors. So we want to limit any exhaust going into our living quarters. Tobacco products, you know, it's the number one risk factor for cancer. I'm not going to beat you up on it. You already know that. Let's talk about our annual exams. We should have an annual medical exam. Just, I mean, every year we have a thorough exam because when it comes down to it, early detection is going to be key. I mean, the earlier we catch our cancer, the better off we're going to be. Maybe it's just surgery. I mean, that's all I had to do. The longer things go by, now we're talking chemo. Now we're talking radiation. Now we're talking about not being able to go back to work. Or we're talking about fighting for our lives. So early detection, doing this annual medical exam is ideal. So the fire chiefs, the firefighters, big unions sat down. They have this WFI. It's very thorough. So hopefully your department is doing that as well. To kind of show you the importance of early detection, you can see um, through this chart here, if you catch your cancer early on, and that's the, the distant number, you can see what the likelihood that you're going to be okay. The, the longer you wait, that localized, you can see what your odds are. But not very good. And these are all when you're stage four. So, again, early detection. So, don't forget, along with medical exams, annual skin exams. So, we need to go to a dermatologist every single year. So, and it's just these, these annual exams, whether it's our, our medical physical, whether it's our skin exam, it's for the rest of our lives. We have to do this because of everything we've been exposed to. With those skin exams, wear sunscreen, wear a hat, even if they look silly, still, it's helpful. Exercising and eating healthy. Exercising reduces your risk, as, as does eating healthy. This is obviously something I need to work on. But foods high in fiber and antioxidants fight cancer, also that, that dreaded portion control. So, sleep. This is something that I think we've, we just have overlooked. You know, that whole, I'll sleep when I'm dead, the whole, I don't know if you're, you know, Warren's of Honor or not, but that's the wrong mentality, mentality to have. Shift work, known carcinogen. So, this bottom part here, this one night of sleep in four or five hours, the body's natural cancer killing cells drop and count by 70%. I know when I work four or five hours, a lot of times that's considered a pretty good night. So doing this over and over again is harmful to us. We have what's called a circadian rhythm, and when we sleep, that is the body's opportunity to rest, to recover. And when that's interrupted all the time, it just wreaks havoc on our, on our body. So we need to do everything we can to work on our sleep latency and also our sleep efficiency. So some of those steps that you could take, install red lights in your bunk room, ramp up the volume tone so to where it starts off really quiet and then gets louder so it doesn't just ah, scare you. You, know, you should only hear your station's tones. I don't care what twos is doing up the road. You know, any, you, should, you should limit any time you wake up. If you can, especially if you're getting a new station, this, these are options where you can get apparatus specific tones. And also, you know, if you're snoring, if you're struggling with sleep, see a sleep doctor. You know, um, another thing I've seen a lot lately is departments just having a rest period, just like between 11 and 1 o'clock, we're not going to do any training. It's, it, the time is yours. Just rest, recover, relax. Uh, you know, take your calls, of course, but other than that, that's your chance to take a nap because naps, naps are healthy for us. This is, this is the, the firefighters, when they see this, this is their favorite slide. They're like, hell yeah, I'm telling my chief. 
we need to have naps. So let's document all of our exposures. So these are the cancers that are covered with your state and the number of years that you have to work to be eligible. So pretty good list. There's like 49 states that North Carolina is the only holdout right now that doesn't have cancer presumption. So out of the ones I've seen, this is, this is pretty good. Um, I wouldn't have been covered, but that's, that's okay. Uh, but along with that, we still need to take care of our exposures, our documentation. So if one of us does get diagnosed, this will be helpful potentially if we have to have a workers comp fight or if one of your firefighters do. So N4s is a big one that's out there. Uh, you can look into that. It's an app. It's also online. You can hook up to your CAD system. Uh, this is basically the exposure form I got, which wasn't a whole lot, but it basically said the number of incidents and how long I was on scene throughout my career. So, you know, I was basically on the fire scene for a month, a solid month, and 480 fires. So, I'm I'm in the middle of my cancer presumption fight right now. So all this stuff is, is going to be beneficial for me. So kind of as a bonus material, let's talk about the ladies. They're often overlooked. A lot of times there's no policies uh, regarding pregnancy and firefighters. But even with that, they have a higher rate of miscarriage and preterm labor than a general public. So I'm not saying that if they get pregnant, you, you make it this way. That's a good way to get sued. But you can let them know these numbers or these odds because there's studies out there. In a perfect world, once they find out they're pregnant, they should stop being firefighters. They, they need to go to some kind of restricted duty or something because it's going to be potentially harmful to that baby. But it's going to be their choice. But you can at least let them know and give them the option. Um, and even when they do have that baby, and if they are breastfeeding, and they have a fire, or they're exposed to something, they need to pump and dump for 72 hours. That's how long it takes to get all these chemicals and carcinogens out of their, their body and they're out of their milk. Otherwise, they're just going to pass that on as well to their baby. So I'll close it down. It's not all doom and gloom. I know it sounds like a lot of it. and I know it went really, really, really quick. But early detection, again, is the key. Reducing your exposure, that's a big deal. Um, you know, I look back at young me with, with a good hairline, and I think about all the dumb shit I did, and I know everybody in this room could probably feel the same way. Knowing what we know now, it's not something we were taught when we went through drill school. But we have an opportunity, especially you guys in this position, to let these kids know from the start, the big picture, you know, the big picture of being kids in our family. I wasn't thinking about them when I was going through drill school. So you guys have that opportunity to pass this on to your firefighters and, and, and talk about the big picture and make sure that they're around. I mean, it's a huge responsibility you have. It's a great opportunity. You just got to remember, cancer doesn't discriminate. You need to protect yourself. You need to protect your family. Anybody have any questions? I know that was a, a lot. I answered everything. You're, you're just ready to get dressed up and go to the banquet, aren't you? Yeah, <laughs> you're like, yeah, <laughs> I am. <laughs> Already dressed up for it. Anything? All right. Well, cool. Thanks for letting me come out here. <laughs>